we've been talking a great deal about equality, and we're turning to focus on climate. But here's the thing: the two go together. Climate is something that should be part of every conversation, integrated. What I want to do today, I have these wonderful two women with me, powerhouses. What I want to do is bring the perspective of the planet. I often say I speak for the forest and give voice to indigenous people. The work I do in protecting tropical rainforests is working directly with communities. And so, as I come here, I'm going to start with Nancy. She is minister for Malawi. As a fellow African, though I live in Austin, Texas, neighboring countries, you have incredible experiences. And we talked earlier today that we think about climate solutions as being complicated, as technology, as many other things. But in my experience, protecting tropical rainforests is one of the most available solutions. Not the easiest, but very easily available. But we complicate things, and. Share with us the solutions that you think we need to think about. Well, let me start. Good morning, leaders. Good morning. Um, I come from Malawi, and uh, firstly to thank the uh, Reykjavik uh, Global Forum for ensuring that we are here to have these conversations. But it's a special way to thank our ambassador to Malawi, Inga. She is a great woman, and uh, the. Thank you. The Iceland government has made sure that what their agenda is here is what they export across borders. And I would like to say that in Malawi they are doing great work because we cannot deal with all these challenges if we have illiteracy. We cannot deal with all these challenges, preach gender equality when women have no、uh, maternal health care, reproductive and sexual health care. And so, in my country, Iceland is helping us construct schools to ensure that communities have accessible schools. Girls go to school because unless we get our girls to go to school and to be educated, all this is in vain. So, thank you very much to the Iceland government. But moving to the issue that we are discussing here about solutions, we in Malawi just this year we had.、Uh, A cyclone, a cyclone that devastated most of the southern part of Malawi, and it is, I think, what obtains in those areas is what obtains elsewhere in Africa. Extreme weathers that have an impact on gender equality. What we lost, we lost food security in those areas. We lost infrastructure in, in, in those areas. We lost schools. We lost hospitals. We lost, we lost road infrastructure and livelihoods and jobs. And so, what happened? Now people stay in camps. When you go to the camps, the face of those camps are women and children. Men have migrated to other areas because now the women are stuck with the kids. They have to look after, make sure the kids eat, make sure they provide in that environment. Now. The women have to cook. The women have to make sure that the kids, even in that environment, have to find a school to go to. So this is where now we need empowerment of these women. How can we empower these women? How can we ensure that these women living in those camps understand the issues of climate change? How can they relate? And now. It brings us the issue of political will that was talked about earlier. Political will. Governments must make sure that communities are sensitised about the links across 
all these sectors. In education, there's an issue of climate change. In uh, health, there's an issue of climate change. Even empowerment and the li very life rules, there's an issue of climate change. Governments must put policies that make sure that people understand. When we have a project that, for instance, is going to encourage communities to restore their landscapes, right. it must not be the communities doing that because they are obeying what the government is saying. The community must understand that this is for our own good. So there's an issue of community participation, sensitization, advocacy, political will, and perhaps the necessary financing that is required for this. But we need to restore our landscapes. We need to ensure that the forests are restored. But that depends on the political will as well. Thank you. So that is amazing, right? Getting it down to the very basics. We talk about climate crisis, responding in a more responsible world. Think about what happened during the pandemic. The world responded almost overnight. We know we can do it. We have the ability. We have the technology. We have the funding, if we so choose. It's just that climate happens slower even when there are far increasing disasters of every kind affecting the majority of us around the planet, it's still slower. So how do we find the political will? And for that, I want to turn to Ida because you've led in so many incredible ways and in sort of putting words in your mouth, I'd like you to talk about how you've managed to lead in some of the most progressive action um, in Denmark. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ida Augen. I'm a member of parliament and I have been for 16 years. And I was the minister for the environment 10 years back. So it's been a while. But I've been working with climate all these years. And I think for us, it's been very important in order to do the structural changes that we've built a coalition that is bipartisan. And that actually creates you have to have patience if you want to build those kind of uh, political coalitions, but they've been instrumental for us to do first a big transition on our energy systems. So we're going to have 100% renewable energy in heat and power in a couple of years from now. And now we're moving to a transition of our agricultural sector. And it's very difficult because there's a lot of emotion, there's a lot of lock-in, there's a lot of people working in those sectors. But we're working with making a CO2 taxation for those uh, sectors. And, and in order to do that, we have to think like we would do in other countries, like in the developing world. How do we get people on board? How do we work with those who are there, who are already in the sectors? Like, for instance, we, we decided to stop drilling oil and gas from the North Sea. Right. And, uh, we are not giving any more new concessions. And we have a lot of people working in that sector. So we actually did training of those people because they are needed in the offshore sector for wind and renewables. So we said, you are not a lost case. We need your skills. And I think working with agriculture in our country, we have to do the same thing to see how, how does a new type of agriculture look? How does a more climate-friendly agriculture look? How do, you, uh, how do we help you get the demand up on not animal-based products, but uh, more plant-based products, which would right. help you in the rainforest, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, so, so to work with the whole, everybody who's there to get them on board, which might be easier in the Nordic because you're not starting with uh, the Trumps of this world, but they will come. We've right. seen that in the Netherlands, we've seen it other places. So you have to, in a way, all the time think about the interest of the people who are already in the sectors, already working. So we've managed to make a climate law 2020, uh, 19 it was, to say we will reduce 70% of our emissions yes. by 2030. And that is sort of setting the framework for all ministries. Um, but it's bipartisan with a very large extent. So yeah, I think you have to have leadership, but also understand the political will in democracies live in the people. You cannot just shout at the leaders, do something. You have to understand that the people build the political will. 
And I think that's the most important aspect, isn't it? That it's not just leaders, it's not the people who are making decisions um, in governments or corporations. How do we bring in people? How do we think about communities, whether you talked about the chiefs that are reforesting and restoring landscapes earlier when we were talking, or you're talking about integrating climate into every ministry? How do we ensure that, being bipartisan as well, that climate becomes something that is not an afterthought, not not something that is an aside, but it's integrated for the good of our whole planet. The huma humanity needs us to move today. And yet, you both talked about how frustrating it is at the COP. We go again and again and again. What would you think we need to do? How could Denmark help Malawi how could Malawi help Denmark to reach some of our goals? And that is why the model that Iceland is pursuing in Malawi is working. Because what they're doing is working with local government. Not working with central government, yes, through central government, but really emphasizing on working with local government, working with the chiefs. Because when you work with the local chiefs, the custodians of our culture, people that live with the people, you understand the issues better. So working at local government level and working with the, and the engaging with local people, you understand them and they understand you. That is why the communities, it has to be a whole of society approach. The communities must understand the issues of climate change because people do not understand the connect you know the connect the connection between climate change and the, the patterns the weather patterns we have to do that advocacy but in doing that we then we get the ideas and incorporate them with what our pol in our government policies and in our engagement internationally it has to come from the community because they are the ones that feel the impact of these issues. If there's going to be financing, it has to target those at the grassroots level. Because if we are going to do landscape restoration, it is not going to be done at the capitals of, of yeah. governments. It has to be done at the village level. The community, the chief must understand that we are doing this for our children tomorrow. So if there's going to be restoration, they will be better you know, committed to that restoration effort. And then there's this, this issue of financing that we have talked about earlier on. If we went to COP27, oh, that's the first COP I attended. It was about financing. How we can we make financing more accessible? How can governments, at least evolve from, like Malawi, we are one of the LDCs. How can we access? The processes are so cumbersome. The money is there but to access that money to make sure that we use it at that level. That is something that we need to address. I hope this co coming COP will be able to address that. But last year at Shama Sheikh, we talked about the same thing, and I know it's on this agenda, this uh, coming uh, uh, COP in, in Dubai. But there has to be resources provided to least developed countries to work with, because we are already operating on a shoestring fiscus. We had the, the COVID situation that impacted on the budgets. We have the debt burden, and then we have these extreme weather conditions. All these need money, and our economies are so fragile. So we need that support. And sometimes when we talk about loss and damage, people think it's about reparation, reparations. It's not. It's about because we are in this together. And unless we deal with the impacts of climate change at that level in least developed countries, the whole world is going to be in trouble. So make the financing available, get ideas, engage communities. And sometimes we make these things like an event. It's like we are approaching COP, then we engage communities. Once we go to COP, we forget about it. And remember again next year when you're, no, it has to be, you know, uh, something that is cross-cutting in all areas. If we're going to a village to discuss about health issues, 
issues of climate change must be there. If we're talking about the youth, because the youth are the biggest demographic in Africa, we, we have to make sure they are on board. In Malawi at the moment, the UNDP is engaging the youth in landscape restoration. That is managing regenerations in our hills, in our mountains, and this is working very well. World vision is part of that. But this means that the communities are engaged, and it's only going to succeed if these communities become part and parcel. The ideas have to come from the community right. to the top. I would agree with the working at the community level, youth, women, um, I get to do that. And some, sometimes the most powerful solutions come when you ask the children, you ask the women, and they form all sorts of structures. But normally we don't ask. As somebody who succeeded in creating some really good structures, how can you and the Nordic countries actually help um, these other countries, whether they're in you know, South America or in Asia or Africa. What do you think? So the, there are some insights that go for everywhere in the world. What motivates people is security yes. and it's opportunity. So if, they, if you can show that this is uh, safe for you or there are new jobs, there are better lives, there is less air pollution, it's, it's the same mechanisms motivating us. But what I think what we learned is really to both, how do we find the funds at home to explain to the Danish people why are we spending a lot of money abroad. Uh, there the security issue comes in. Uh, but, but we can also say, we, what, we make, what we do at home, our climate goals, they don't matter. We're like 0.1% yes. of the emissions on the planet. It only matters if we can help somebody else do the same. Right. So we've really focused on capacity building. So, for instance, if Denmark is working with Indonesia to transform their energy system, we don't just come with a wind turbine and say, build this. You know, we work with the communities. Why are they stuck on coal? Or why are they stuck on gas? How can we help them? How can we show that a coal-fired power plant pollutes a lot more? Or how can we help with the stoves so you get other incentives to, to, to do the heating? So I think for us, the, the last maybe 10, 20 years, by integrating development policies and climate policies and understanding that if we don't work with the communities and let them decide what is the need, it's, gonna, it's not going to work. So if we're to defend anything at home, the big investments we do on transportation, energy, food, it's only really well relevant if somebody else wants to do some of the same things. So I think that is also an important issue to, to tell the story of that this is not splitting our country, it's actually creating new jobs, it's creating new opportunities, and then learning how, how to work with, with the people that we are, we are building capacities for. Right. So, so there, like I talked to the minister from Indonesia, and they have a wonderful legislation for the water around their islands, but he's like, yeah, but we have 17,000 islands, islands and three yeah. bureaucrats to, you know, enforce this law. So how can we work with capacity building from that perspective? How can we work with new technologies also in enforcing laws? How can we work with technology transfer? These are the issues that, that we are trying to, to... And we do that by integrating climate and development. And I think that is the big transformation just from 10 years back where it was always a fight. Do the money go there or do they go there? With the SDGs, we actually managed to say true development, like you say, Minister, is really integrating climate into all issues and, and making people see how can we restore land? How can we do regenerative leadership? How can we rebuild things? It's not only preventing loss and damages, it's also creating a better world. And actually creating a regenerative economy that actually works for everyone. We have the models. For me, when I talk about regenerative economy, I want to include planet, I want to include indigenous peoples, I want to include women, so that a share goes back to those groups and ecosystems. So here's, as a parting note to everybody, um, I know we could talk forever, we could, <laughs> What would you do, regardless of whatever you're doing, whether it is energy or um, you are in whatever sector you are in government, whatever your portfolio, how would you integrate climate? How would you bring the lowest level of education 
and focus on communities and sort of bottom-up solutions.